Thank you very much. Um, I can't see the, because I've not got Mentee up on my phone, so I can't see sure. what the responses were to that first question about whether people have seen the health profile for England. So, um, so well, what we can do is, so you've asked two questions. The, the, yeah. the first one is about the, um, the health profile for England and the second one is about the East and Midlands one. So should we just ask the questions and then look yeah. at the answers and, and then, you, then you'll know who's heard of who, who and who hasn't. So I'll, what I'll do is I'll share my screen again and then you'll be able to see the results. Let's see what people are saying. OK, so this is this is the first one. So the um, this is what people people's reactions to the health profile for England. So most mm -hmm. people this is this is great for you. Uh, so most people um, haven't heard of it, but they would like to find out more. So, so I'm thinking that's a, that's a good starting position for you. So some people have heard of it and some people have read it as well, but mostly a vast majority um, have have haven't heard of it. OK, so that's the first one. So um, it's likely that we'll have a similar picture for the East and West Midlands reports as well, because they're, they're based on that, aren't they? And I know yeah, you're going to be talking. Right. I know I'm stealing the show. And no, 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 no. It's all about this in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> uh, such a spoil sport. <laughs> Um, yeah, so great. I, I think this is this is this is good to hear, uh, and it just goes to show, Becca, that that um, it's very worthwhile coming to talk to people about this because it, these are really excellent resources. There's so much information in there, and mm. um, and and you know, through through various routes, we can tell people more about them. Okay, great. I think I think we've we've got a a really good feel for um, uh, what people know about these, and I'm gonna. I'll go with you. At that point, she's frozen. <laughs> I'll give it. I'll give her a minute or two, and then I'm. I'm very happy to um, pick on somebody else to talk about it. I've done extensive research myself on um, the health profile for England. Not. <laughs> So I'm hoping I'm hoping Becca's going to um, join join us shortly. For those of you mm -hmm. in the room who um, said they had read the uh, report or you are familiar with it at least, is anybody able to sort of add to that, elaborate on that? You can just shout out. Janine. How, how, what, what are your thoughts on the health profile for England? It is an important. What I, what I, I, found I th out, it's. I I think it's a. It's our first. Look at what's ha happened to the health of the population since COVID. Yeah. So it's a, and I think both the publication of the health profile for England last year and, bringing the data that was in the health profile for England, down to that regional level. Um, it, was really, it was a really important time to kind of take that step back and say, have a look at it and say what has happened to the health of the population over the last couple of years with COVID. Um, clearly, we didn't have all of the data coming through at that point, but as much as we could, we have um, used the data in there to start to tell that picture. And, and it does, it shows things like the widening inequalities that we had because of COVID mm. but it also set some of that context around levelling up and the fact that healthy life expectancy was starting to stall um, before the pandemic. Yeah. The pandemic clearly had a massive impact on overall life expectancy and healthy life expectancy but the drops that we saw during the pandemic we were already starting to see before the pandemic and the pandemic has just exacerbated it. There's, it's a nice interactive report. There's an awful lot of health inequalities data in there. And it really does start to set out the stall in terms of um, the burden of disease. Whilst, whilst we've clearly had the devastating impact on people's lives, people's our mortality rates because of COVID, we can, it also shows very clearly the, the drivers of ill health and kind of a lot of our excess deaths were very much still in the 
cardiovascular disease, respiratory disease and cancer. So all of that kind of non-communicable disease, um, epidemiology we were doing pre-pandemic is just as important to the work that we're doing now and how we plan yeah. our services. Yeah. Um, come on, Becca, I'm... I'm I'm doing this without any pictures. It's much better with pictures. No, I like to look at you, Janine, personally. I think it's great. <laughs> um, and, um, and, it, and, it, and it does bring in kind of the global burden of disease, which actually sets out really clearly the links between those primary risk factors. So it, it is still smoking. It is still obesity that are driving preventable mortality in our non-communicable diseases and it starts to touch on some of the um, wider determinants of health. So from my perspective and the way that we've used it in the Midlands, it's been a really useful resource document to help us to reset the context that we need to be working in, not downplaying the importance of COVID on people's health and well-being and the importance the impact that's had on health and care services and our need to recover health and care services and some of the impacts the um some of the impacts that lack of access to services during COVID has had on things like um early diagnosis early diagnosis of cancer and that kind of things all through there. Um mm -hmm. but just a really it, it just really useful resetting the scene thinking through what are the population health challenges that we all need to be addressing, trying to set out as much as we can in terms of the levelling up agenda and kind of the core 20 plus five. There's quite a lot of yeah. um, disaggregation of data down to deprivation deciles, age and sex and ethnicity where that data is available and we've been able to make those population breakdowns. So the drill throughs that some of the drill throughs that we've got there are better than we've had in the past. And it, it does, it's not a complete picture of health in the region, but it, it's a really good setting out of the story from where we are. Yeah. Okay, and that, that's that's really that's really useful. I think um, from my sort of brief chat with uh, Becca on on um, what she was going to be presenting on, I think see the thing is you you see and we all have um, had so much um, so much information, so many reports, so much research about COVID, its impact, and sometimes you see a heading the impact of COVID on and you think well I know the answer and this isn't something I need to know more about I, I know it's exacerbated health inequalities um, uh, and the, the, I, I feel I, I'm, I'm on top of this and I don't need to know more so I think I think the angle from uh, or what I was learning really from what Becca's going to be talking about and the, the health profile for England and the the associated East and West Midlands reports were that actually there is some new new information or a, a new way of looking at it um it's not changing the story it's not changing the punchline that is the same but it's giving more information more um sort of tangible information and intelligence so that people can go and use use it to, in their plans in their strategies like you said the the, the strategies the plans aren't necessarily going to change um but new information and it will always help fine tune what people are, are doing and it will make sure you're on the right track and you've got the evidence to support what, what you are doing. I, th I think some of the things that are starting to come through very clearly and they come through in the health pro in the East and West Midlands reports are the huge impact that we've seen on people's overall health and wellbeing status during um, mm. the pandemic so the early indicators around the impact of the impact of um lockdowns on people's um the kind of core health and well-being metrics i've just and we're starting to see with other evidence that it's had a massive impact on childhood obesity status there's been a really big increase in the number of children that are measuring mm. as being overweight and obese and the potential so seeing those metrics getting worse so rapidly during the pandemic and actually I think there is 
a much bigger job for local systems to help to address some of those things that fundamentally drive um, longer term health outcomes and people's yeah. um, overall state of well-being is a really important emerging story and I, I, I'm going to bring Mark Pearson in because his hand was up. I've just been to have a look to see if I can find Becca's presentation on the server, but I've lost all access to the um, drive. So I'm just wondering if we've got something going on at our end around RIT that is <laughs> right, why, we, why, we've, why we've lost Becca, but I can't find Robin's. I can't find. Don't, don't worry. Don't worry about that. That's that's absolutely fine. She, she, she might she might join us again. But I'm very interested to know what Mark's got to say. Mark, what can you can you add anything to this? Thank you very much. Um, so my reflection and I guess challenge based on what we're experiencing Leicester, Leicester and Rutland. Mm -hmm. I, I think we're at a, it seems to me we're at a critical juncture. So we've talked for the longest time, we've been talking for at least five years, if not 10 years about this, the challenge that the plethora of data from various sources poses to executive boards, poses to, uh, you know, medical leadership teams. It's really, it's it's really very difficult for people to see the wood from the trees and the current crisis around emergency care, I think is making it more and more difficult for people to take a strategic view around the core central tr truths that Janine has uh, sort of articulated and that you've articulated, which is that some of the very basic, really big picture um, impactful things haven't changed actually. So the pandemic has added new layers of challenge around behaviours relating to risk factors, so people drinking more at home, people's mental health deteriorating, people um, eating a poorer diet for a variety of reasons, including the, the cost of living crisis. So I think one of the real challenges for analysts as a professional body is how do we actually present data in such a way and how do we bring to our professional interactions a real clarity around what the messages are, because I think in circumstances where responsible officers are under pressure from NHS England to solve the ambulance waiting times, to solve the ED waiting times, etc., it becomes really difficult to articulate in a way that to make the numbers tell the story and to be more insistent about saying, essentially, although there's all this noise and very real problems here right in front of your face, Actually, if you're going to take a strategic approach to uh, population health and indeed to financial stability for systems, you simply cannot get away from acknowledging that these are the core long term problems. So I think analysts have a real role there, both in terms of the quality of the presentations they make uh, and the sort of accessibility, how we make data accessible, yeah. but also in terms of leadership in the room about being insistent that people don't move away from looking at these data and committing to make investments, however constrained the circumstances are. And that may be about, I suspect a lot of it is about the value-based commissioning conversation. Can I reply to Mark a little bit before we bring Nikki in? So um, an awful lot of work went into generating the report, but the the bit that I was particularly involved in, uh, in over in OHID was developing the central narrative that goes through the report and developing that narrative in partnership with our senior leadership team in a way that um, we had, we have got a very, very clear central nav narrative out of that report with some very clear with a very clear sense of what the central story is, but we wrote that in a way that um, was very shareable with the NHSEI regional leadership team um, and in a way that we wanted to sit and disseminate out through um, all of our organisations, but starting with those senior leadership teams and trying to then cascade the messages down through the organisation rather than just writing another big pretty report that sits on an internet somewhere that people may, may or may not stumble across. We, we really wanted to get that story kind of front and centre of 
all of the planning conversations that are due to take place. And it's very difficult to get some of these conversations onto the agenda at the moment because all of these organisations are battling everything that you're talking about. They're battling the they're battling the ambulance backlogs. They're battling with COVID recovery and trying to get their clinics back up and running. They're they're starting to battle with the pressures that are coming through for winter pressures, but just trying to fundamentally reset the picture and the thinking into actually we all have a responsibility to be thinking about how we can have a sustainable health system going forwards and you don't get a sustainable health system by fixing the ambulance backlogs you get people that can be seen and treated in an appropriate length of time but we do actually need to be working together across whole systems to tackle the things that make people ill in the first place rather than just fixing them up and letting them go again so so we we did work very hard to pull people together and get that central narrative through everything that we did and and it's going to take time it's going to take time of having the right senior leaders there with the right pack of half a dozen slides that we've put through to tell this very coherent story repeating the story over and over and over again and actually how we can build start to support building some of that into our longer range plans is a bigger job that will take longer for us to do and we're, we're kind of at the start of the journey in the same way all of our local organizations are in terms of the stp planning but you've, you've got to start the conversation and the conversation has to be clear simple and consistent Nikki, your hand's been up and you've been sat there really patiently. That's fine. Sorry, I, I've only I've come in late, so apologies. I'm going on a off on a total tangent. But you mentioned about COVID and health inequalities, and my partner um, was very healthy until six months ago when he got COVID. He was triple jabbed, and he's now got uh, oh, a long list of health conditions: oh, like heart failure, atrial fibrillation, oh. five different heart conditions, and he's he's been in, in and out of hospital and he's out now on the drugs of last resort that will lead to kidney failure and liver failure so if he gets kidney failure he can't have a heart transplant and the options are quite limited for him however um having left hospital the last time i saw a doctor in the hospital he was told he can still work full time the drugs are definitely going to work but obviously they haven't worked um so it was going to be three months before he could see a consultant we've already waited six months um but but now he can't be seen by that consultant because he's not a specialist in electrical hearts which my boyfriend now needs more of a specialist consultant than the original consultant but anyway this all leads on the reason it comes down to health inequalities is through his work he's got bupa so rather than waiting three months we're now being seen in a week so that obviously when it comes to treatment if he waited three months the drugs are starting to not work already he wouldn't be suitable for treatment in three months time i don't believe i'm not a clinician but now he's seen them next week because he's fortunate that he can afford to do that and he's got a job that will support that. He's then going to be bumped three months up the waiting list. But all the health inequalities analysis I've seen has never linked in with the private sector. So it's not that as a trust we choose to give interventions to people sooner. It's just by having private scans, by having private consultations, you've automatically bumped up the waiting list. And I think that massively impacts on health inequalities and I as far as I'm aware I haven't seen any data on that so I don't know whether we even capture that in our reports so, to say that they've had a private consultation or whatever. so so we 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 don't capture private treatment data in the same way because we don't commission it so the the way that data flows is very much linked into the legal basis for data flowing and it that becomes we are the NHS, so the data that flows to the NHS. We could flag it on our systems if we genuinely want to improve health inequalities. We need to understand the full journey, don't we, that people with more money have got these advantages that people without money don't have. So, But I, I, I think the legal, I, yes, and I completely understand what you're saying, and you're moving very much into an area that I don't particularly know and understand in terms of data flows, but because it's a private transaction between a member of the public and 
Booper, I, I, and I, I, it's worth looking into. I don't think there is a legal basis for that data to flow from Bupa to NHS Digital and back out to local systems. And I, I do appreciate what you're saying. It is a hole in the way that we look at health inequalities, which is why we look at inequalities in health outcomes rather in that way. Um, and we do look at inequalities in access to services, but I, 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 I suspect that's a huge gap. Um, and I'm just going to I'm going to look to Rachel to say, is that something that we can potentially go away and ask the ask Stephen Wyatt to have a look into in terms of how data flows? And can I just say how terribly sorry I am for where you and your partner are? It sounds absolutely horrendous and long covid is absolutely. absolutely horrendous and i am so sorry for what you're going through and yeah. i'm well, really sorry that i can't answer your help. question so, yeah so, same same here nikki I'm, I'm, I'm very sorry to be about your partner I, I do hope it gets resolved um i, I can see that becky's coming to the room again but before we go on to should becky, we just who, quickly ask peter do you want to yeah, pick I want, up I want peter's to, yeah, question or should we hand over absolutely. to becca no, no, no. She, Becky, Becky's fine. Becca's fine. She's she'd be panicking, and she can just see that we're having a nice chat, and then she can she can join in and and um, come back to her presentation very shortly, and that's fine. Uh, Peter, uh, what what can you have? You got something to add? Enlighten yes. us about this. It was, it was an interesting comment because I've had a number of discussions with charities about the collection of data that were open to it for MPFT because we do use some charities. And I also had an initial discussion about what is the potential of trying to get the number of calls to, to suicides, for example, to see if you could track well, if if the if there are more people answering calls for suicides, do you reduce the number of people going into an acute with an attempted suicide? And then mm -hmm. the, how how does that work with mental health, etc.? And I'm not a clinician. Um, I was just curious in data flow. But if uh, I suppose if the third sector is happy to have that discussion with me, why potentially wouldn't Booper be happy or another private? why not make that jump to that and it's quite challenging because i can i can see it quite as a whole concept of icbs and what we are it is a challenging statement but why yeah. not approach Bupa and private and say if we had your data what could that do for health inequality as a whole because can i yeah, go on. Sorry, Peter. I'm just aware that we have really digressed from the purpose mm -hmm. of this meeting. Can I just say that I think it would be a really interesting follow up session to ask Rachel to arrange for the network to talk it's about um, alternative data flows for some of the things that don't go through the standard routes of data from providers to NHS digital back out to local systems. I'm not an expert, but my understanding is under ICBs, you are able to have additional data flows that you put in place. But I don't think we've got the right experts on the line at the moment to answer the questions and think, but think it's really important and we should follow it up. So if we hand that to Rachel to pick up and yeah. then go and hand it back to Becca and I can stop making things up and talking. OK, so so before I hand back to Becca, thank, thanks, Janine. Uh, a, a really nice chat. I was, I've, I've got loads of other questions for you, actually, but that, that's, it's another session, isn't it? And thanks, Nikki. I hope your partner gets uh, better. I really do. And thank you everybody else for contributing. So, so Becca, you've got a story to tell us, haven't you? What happened? Yeah. Did you, was, I was, I, was, I really, was I was a bit boring? I mean, I, I am from time to time. I, I, I get that. No, I honestly don't know what happened. There oh, was. Don't worry, don't worry about it at all. Did you see any of it at all? Not, I don't. Not really. No. <laughs> we saw we saw the front screen. Um, but you might have to do a sort of a slightly shorter version. But don't worry about it. Yeah. It's absolutely fine. Honestly, just go That's for it. Oh no! <laughs> Sorry about that. I was yeah. just talking away, and then the dog started barking. I thought oh. everything's gone quite quiet, and then I realised that actually I wasn't sharing. You were talking to yourself. Then. Talking yeah. to myself. Well, anyway, I've, I've had a good another good practice. So, um, right, I'll, I'll crack on then. So, sure. 
so yeah so um i guess um did you did I do the introduction and talked about my two roles and did you um it? no i think i think okay. we, we we kind of got, just go, go from the beginning it's, okay it's so so yes so my name is rebecca Ellery, and i've taken up as the comment role with the healthcare public health team in nhs england in the midlands as their knowledge and intelligence analytical manager however i led on the production of the reports i'm about to present on uh, whilst working in my substantive role uh, back in the department of health's office for health improvement and disparities local knowledge and intelligence service so I guess I'm here with two hats on, so to speak, um, raising the profile and sharing the insights from this piece of work, but also here in my current role to start making those closer links with other NHS colleagues and, and learning from those working in the system. So hello. <clears throat> um, and yes, it's always nice to share this presentation with a fresh pair of eyes. Uh, right, so. Uh, in this presentation, I'm just going to give you an idea of the production process we went through, as I think we're all mainly analysts, and I think this can be sometimes useful insight to share. I'll then take you through a summary of the evidence in the regional health profiles, which I think for the first time shows at a regional level um, the story of the direct, and I think what's fair to say, is devastating impact of COVID on the health of our populations. And as you'll see, there's a clear evidence of widening health inequalities, impacts on the wider determinants of health, increasing risk factors, and also a reduction in access to services. And these are all interacting together to have a significant and enduring harm to the overall health of our population. And that this has been um, disproportionately felt by the most vulnerable in our communities. So I'm not going to take you through all the content of the report and um, just what I've done is chosen the key headline metrics that form a narrative to give you a sense of the scale of the challenge I guess we are facing as a system to meet the ambitions set out in the levelling up white paper and also in relation to the new duties for ICBs around inequalities. OK, so the regional reports are based on the annual health profile for England um, I don't have access to the chat, but uh, there's a link in this um, presentation here, which you'll get afterwards. And uh, so the, the health profile for England is just a, an annual snapshot of the health of the population in a given year. It was introduced in 2017 and each year there are changes to the format and content in line with changing priorities. So it's currently produced by the population health analysis team in OHID. And the 2021 report is a HTML format, contains lots of narrative and also evidence around some of the contemporary research um, around the impact of COVID on our inequality groups. There's lots of information in there. And then of course, all the interactive charts as well. And it covers these chapters um, that you can see there on the screen. So key indicators around COVID, and mortality and life expectancy, child health, health in adults, risk factors, and uh, the wider determinants of health, and also health protection as well. So where available in the regional reports, data shows variation over time by inequality groups and also our regional local authorities. It draws together a range of publicly available data from OHID fingertips profiles, such as um, public health outcomes framework and also the COVID health inequalities monitoring in England tool or the CHIME tool. Uh, there's also all the data in there from the UK HSA COVID dashboards and also the global burden of disease tool. So the reports are a really comprehensive snapshot of the state of the population's health prior to the pandemic and also where available um, for the first year or two. Uh, so the regional reports were a bit of an experiment in how to take a national profile and reproduce it as a do once for all. And um, the aim was to automate the analysis as much as possible. Um, so this involved the fantastic skills of a central project team who extracted, analysed and visualised all the data using R. A narrative template was then shared with each region and this required data manually being plugged in uh, using the set of charts that were created for each region. So not completely automated, but this give e gave each region a chance to read through the data and make any changes relevant for their region. Each region then supplied the completed text back to the analytical team and our markdown was then used to weave together the narrative text and code. So um, there are individual reports for both East and West Midlands. Um, 
because at the moment we don't have we didn't have the data uh, for the full Midlands footprint, but I don't think that really matters. I think it's a good way of highlighting what the differences are between the East and West and, and these footprints are still very relevant, I think, for most of our systems. So this is not in the report, um, but just I wanted to give a quick overview of the Midlands. Um, the red areas are the areas across the Midlands where the 20% most deprived of our populations live. And overall, the Midlands has high levels of deprivation with over 26% of the population living in the most deprived quintile. Um, nationally, the evidence shows that the COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated existing inequalities in both risk factors and outcomes, as you'll see, for our most deprived populations. And I think this map just highlights where we find these populations, and these are mainly in our urban centres, ex-industrial towns, the county areas, and also coastal towns of Lincolnshire. And these will all bring their own unique challenges driven by their geographical location. So now I'm just going to take you through some slides that show you what's happening. So this slide uh, prevent, presents trends in healthy life expectancy, and this is a key metric for understanding overall health. It's a measure of the average number of years a person would expect to live in good health based on contemporary mortality rates and also um, prevalence of self-reported good health. And the data presented here covers years prior to the pandemic. And as we can see in more recent years, there have been slight reductions in healthy life expectancy. So that in males and females in 2017-19, it was around 62 years. And um, this is in the East Midlands, but similar for the West Midlands as well. So this means that the number of years that men and women can expect to live with poor health has increased. And this is now over 20 years for women and 17 years for men. And this increase in the number of years that people will live with poor health reduces their ability to work, their sense of well-being and increases their need to access services. It's also important to note that in males and females, the average healthy life expectancy is well below the current retirement age. And this, of course, is perhaps storing up trouble for workforce productivity both now and in the future. So at national level, we have healthy life expectancy split by deprivation decile. And this shows that um, <clears throat> the difference in healthy life expectancy is around 18 years lower in the least deprived compared to the most deprived. Um, so although overall we see poor health kicking in around the early 60s, in some of our more deprived populations in the region, this will be impacting on people's lives as young as their early 50s. So of course this inequality that we see here is not COVID driven, but it will be exacerbated by its um, direct impacts. And these stark inequalities, I guess, are only going to likely widen. So when we look at this in terms of all age, all cause mortality, we can see that in the past 10 years, the improvements in all age and premature mortality have slowed down for both males and females. Um, but for the pandemic year, we see this really clear uptick, particularly in males of all ages. And this, of course, is related to um, the number of COVID deaths that we've seen. So I think by the end of 2021, there were over 17,000 deaths registered in the region with COVID on the death certificate. So whether we will see a return to pre-pandemic levels in mortality rates over the next few years, I guess, remains to be seen. But we may still see this kind of long shadow of COVID and the impact of the disruption it caused to services and changes to risk among the populations for many years to come. So, of course, the this increase in mortality has driven the drop in life expectancy we see here in 2020, and this is now at around 82 years for females and 78 for males, and it's similar between the East and West. Um, so the report provides a regional analysis of the inequality in life expectancy and it uses a slope index of inequality to do this and compares what the gradient was in 2019 to 2020. So the grey bars are 2019 and the blue bars are 2020 and we have females on the left and males on the right. So while we saw a fall in life expectancy across deprivation deciles, the decrease was largest in the more deprived populations. And there is now a gap of nine years in life expectancy for women and 11 years for males. And we see a similar picture in the East Midlands as well. 
So this means there's been a, a stark increase between 2019 and 2020 um, in the index of inequality and to over a year and a half difference. So this is, of course, driven by COVID and the unequal impact it's had on our most disadvantaged populations. So there's a lot going on in this chart, um, but it just illustrates the main conditions that are driving the inequalities in life expectancy um, in 2019 on the left and in 2020 on the right. And the grey bars are for females and blue for males. And I think it just makes it clear that COVID has driven this increase in inequalities in life expectancy that we see contributing more than a year to the difference between the most and least deprived. However, there were already significant inequalities in life expectancy driven by key conditions such as heart disease, respiratory disease and cancer. And that the need to focus on these conditions to reduce inequalities, of course, remains as well, despite COVID. So just going through um, some charts that tell the story around the drivers of inequality. In terms of the impact of COVID on widening health inequalities, this chart uh, for the West Midlands just shows a huge difference in the mortality rate between ethnicity groups. And this will, of course, underlie uh, some of that increase in inequality that we've seen. Uh, this chart presents the global burden of disease data. It gives us a way of demonstrating the relationship between risk factors and health outcomes. And the report draws on this data to show the relationship between risk factors and mortality and morbidity. So this chart, chart just shows the proportion of all age standardised deaths um, for these conditions that are attributable to behavioural, metabolic and environmental risk factors. And I think it highlights just how key modifiable risk factors such as tobacco, poor diet, poor management of hypertension, blood glucose and BMI, for example, uh, contribute to the inequalities we have just seen in life expectancy. That these are, of course, attributed to the key conditions of CVD, respiratory disease and, and cancers. I think of note as well are um, you know, as we go into the cost of living crisis and the impact of fuel poverty is the relationship between living in an environment of suboptimal temperatures and deaths from CVD and respiratory disease. And, you know, these actually account for more deaths than alcohol use does, as estimated in this data. So we are starting to see the impact of COVID coming through in many of our data sets. Um, so just using the East Midlands to illustrate the impact of COVID on people's well-being. All four measures of self-reported well-being show concerning trends over the pandemic with significant percentage point increases in self-reported anxiety, low happiness and satisfaction among the region's population and we see a similar thing for uh, the West Midlands as well. So this slide just draws together a few of, uh, of the key points that I thought would be interesting to raise from the report and that highlight the potential for the ongoing impact of COVID on inequalities. So for alcohol, there was an increase in the rate of deaths from alcohol specific conditions, and this was particularly high uh, in the West Midlands. So I think there was an increase of around 33% or 224 deaths uh, in 2020 compared to 2019. Uh, I guess a good news story is that overall smoking prevalence continues to decline and in 2020 was around 13%, but there are of course inequalities in smoking prevalence, particularly among those in routine and manual occupations where around one in five continue to smoke and those with a long-term mental health conditioning where one in four. So these inequalities do persist. Um, adding to the increase in uh, risk factors for ill health is the impact of the pandemic on the use of health services as well and this may have influenced health outcomes across the life course. So there were significant reductions in outpatient and inpatient admissions to hospital during um, the pandemic and whilst emergency hospital admissions have returned to pre-pandemic levels I think outpatients and elective admissions are still below um, pre-pandemic levels. And particularly concerning are the 8,000 fewer cancer patients that entered treatment for the Midlands uh, during the time period analysed uh, compared to pre-pandemic levels. And I guess it will not be known for some time how this is going to affect um, this population's health. So 
Uh, just some of those wider determinants points. Uh, during the first year of the pandemic, the employment rate decreased in the region overall, worsening the socioeconomic drivers of health outcomes already experienced by the most deprived areas. And I guess it remains to be seen how the effects of COVID on the wider determinants of health may be compounded further by the rising cost of living that we're seeing at the moment. So I think this report just highlights the key areas for action on the drivers of inequalities, if we are indeed to meet the challenge set out in the Leveling Up White Paper and also the ICB duties around um, inequalities as well. So that's my report. I'll end and stop sharing. Glad I made it through to the end without disappearing. <laughs> <laughs> I, had it, I had it covered. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, thanks very much, Becca. Now that's uh, that, that was a really nice uh, summary of the other of report and and your findings, and it was really clear um, what, the, what the key areas are that for, for people to sort of focus on. And just having that evidence, having having the numbers, it, it, it makes a big difference between just making the statement and then being able to prove it or demonstrate it at the very least. Um, I don't think I have any questions in in the. Uh, on, on, on Menti, but I will, of course, double check. Uh, no, I don't think I have any questions on Menti. But if anybody in the room does have some, wants to make any comments or contributions, then shout out if you can't put your hand up, because I, I do know. Um, and um, otherwise, Janine, over to you. I, th I was just going to kind of just thanks Becca it was much better told with some pictures to help you accompany <laughs> it than it was my attempt to ramble through it earlier I, I just wanted to say to people that are on the call is the data is all firmly embedded in fingertips and um, so the data that we've presented through the regional health profile um, much of it you can go and get much more locally specific breakdowns that are relevant to your local areas. Um, so I would encourage I would encourage you to go and have a read of the report, but also very well aware that um, whilst the East Midlands and the West Midlands report do have strategic importance for us in OHID and the way that we work, particularly with the wider system, but much of the data that we've presented is there in a huge amount of detail on fingertips and you can go through from the report to access some of the data and tools where you can get that more locally specific data for your areas. That's, that's really useful. Uh, fingertips is a great resource. I think every so often we should we should come back and just remind people uh, how to access it and get the most from it and the fact that you can get data directly from there as well is, is really useful. Um, it's good to see that you um, were using our, our markdown to um, bring these reports together, something that um, we feel quite strongly about, that it should be sort of more, more prevalent, R should be more prevalent. And uh, the, there is, of course, the NHSR conference that's happening next week in Birmingham. If anybody is interested to go to Edgbaston, there's just, um, just up the road, depending on where you are, and um, on the 16th. Oh my goodness, is it 16th and 17th? This has been recorded, so I, I should really get this right. Anyway, I'm going, I'm going, and we, we're going to be, we're, we're going we're gonna to have a stand and I'm going to uh, uh, talk to people as well. Um, no, so yeah, thanks again. Um, there's, there's a couple of things I can, if there's no more questions, I would just, just do, uh, so, say, say thank you, Becca and Janine. Thank you for, for, for standing in and, and talking to me. Thank you for talking to me. I really appreciate it. I was My other question to you, and you don't have to answer now, was going to be to tell us all about your new job, because I think it's relevant to this group. So I think it'd be really interesting to hear about that. Um, but I will I will now go on and just talk a bit. Nick, Nikki, did you want to come in there? You did. I, I did. You've I got just said, I've had a, like another experience again has been like a... a care or a loved one of someone in hospital so when um when my partner was in hospital he'd had some yeah. various tests that tell him what his heart failure is like so the first time mm. he had a test he was told it was um 40 40 percent which mm. I, I don't know i think you have to be above 55 to be normal and below that is mild um mm. heart failure and 
further below that is um, uh, moderate and then obviously okay. severe. So at 40%, okay. he, I, as I understand it, he's moderate heart failure. And if he was a little bit higher, it'd be mild heart mm. failure. Okay. Um, okay. So he was 40%. Then he was measured again at King's Mill when he was an inpatient there and he was 43%. So in his mind, improved. But when mm. we spoke to a cardiologist, he said, actually, that the tests aren't that accurate. They say, <sighs> you can say you're moderately heart failure and, and you're moderate mm. heart failure. You're not, you've not actually changed. So then he had another test as an inpatient. He was told this time he was 38%. But the person who did the test said, oh, if you were... If you were 43 before and you're now 38, you you have deteriorated. And that's because um, obviously you've been in hospital a week in your heart. You've uh, And it, so mm. he now thinks he's worse off. And I've tried to explain confidence intervals to him and he's he's mm. oblivious. But people people generally, uh, the need to know that actually these, these don't mean any different. You haven't got better. You haven't got worse. You, you're still moderate, but there's no explanation with the tests. And even the people doing the tests don't understand yeah I, I appreciate you can't go on about confidence intervals in a explanatory letter but i just think there's a lot more we can do for patients that are getting the totally the wrong impression yeah. that their health has either improved or in or deteriorated when actually it's still there. yeah yeah ab absolutely there must be a way of just communicating that information without saying the words confidence uh intervals or limits i mean i love con confidence in intervals and limits <laughs> but not everybody does and i don't get that but in that context there must be a way of saying within this range this is fine you haven't changed you yeah, know it's not it's not difficult so it, so that is something that somebody can um pick up on i'm sure um Okay, I'm just I'm just seeing we have we have uh, a couple of other people. Uh, Nikki, if, if 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 did you want to add anything there? Or should I shall I move on to these other yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, other these other hands? Okay, so so first we have uh, Irene. Did you want to add something, Irene? Yes, hi. Um, oh, yeah. And it's a question for Rebecca. Um, thanks for presenting that. And I was wondering. Um, I suppose in a light of the NHSR festival coming up and some of the work, I wondered if how much of the code used to produce the report is um, available or going to be published um, in open access so that we can sort of look at the R markdown and, and maybe reproduce question. similar things. No, it's a really good question. And it's, uh, I think as a team, we have presented on how we constructed all the code and everything to another team. So I think we do have that presentation to share. Um, I think some of it we have to censor because it's all about where our folders are and pathways and things like that. But we should be able to share something. But I'll I'll check with the the central team. Okay. If you if you could do that, Becca, and then if you could share something with me, then I can I can I can pass it on to people who are interested. Thanks very thanks very much for that question, Irene. Good very good question. Um, are you going to go to the conference, Irene? You don't have to answer. Actually, I've just realised uh, we're, we're, we're approaching we're approaching the end, but we have we have time for Ian. Ian, would you like to say something? Yeah, just very quickly. It was a follow on from Nikki's uh, comments about uh, well the public perception of information right. in, okay. in terms of that uh, clinician patient relationship. Um, if you haven't seen it already, I think Hannah Fry, um, just is a statistician. She um, in, how to say she had a cancer journey uh, documented yeah. uh, it was the bbc program making sense of cancer and one of the points she was making was this understanding of risk and how that's communicated so yeah just validating that point nikki made it's uh, um yeah difficult to convey risk or yeah. uncertainty yeah thanks thanks ian that's that's really helpful um I know, I know a little bit about Hannah Fry. I think she's she's really great. Uh, she's fantastic. She's so good. We invited her to take part of our, in our Insight Festival, um, and that was all going to happen. And unfortunately, she can't. So she's we should we should be there next year. Sarah, I think we've just got time for you before before we we are uh, we're closing today. Where Thank you, you very much. Sorry, my camera. Anyway, um, okay. I, I was very interested. I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of the uh, gentleman who was talking from uh, Rutland and kind of Leicestershire, talking about how difficult it is to get the information at the right level to the right senior leadership team etc and as a governor of course we have responsibility um for a, a, a governor of a, an acute foundation trust the governors have responsibility also for representing the interests of the patients and and uh, across the system and i was just wondering if there's a way that we can think about 
getting that information to governors so they can be challenging the um, acute board uh, to make sure that those, those health inequalities are being covered. Because I certainly know that, that there's this real difficulty with how quickly do you want to sort of rush through the um, elective backlog, which, and, and you've talked about this so many times, haven't you, about, um, but that may be disadvantageous to some of the people with the, the, the greatest deprivation. So those questions need to be asked and governors, I think, can really help ask, by asking those questions if we can get the information out to them. That's a, that, that's a really good point, Sarah. Um, I, and this is, we, we've hit 12 o'clock, uh, so there'll be people will be going. The, the tummies will be rumbling and people will be disappearing. But just to sort of, uh, so I won't, I won't invite uh, a response from from, from our, our panel here. Um, I've, I've turned you into a panel, guys. How, how about that? Is that okay? <laughs> yeah, you put your camera on. You're part of the panel. That's that's how it works. Um, so, but I would, I would just say I, those, those. I've, as he was talking, I was writing all these things down um, about. It's just getting the information to the right people at the right time in the right format. It's about communications. Uh, it's so important to be able to um, be heard by the people who you want to influence. It's by you want you want to get the messages across. And it's 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 extremely important. We spend a lot of time. Uh, a good proportion of the training and development program is um, about helping analysts, in particular, to communicate better to others. Um, and to share their share their work, share the evidence in a way that is uh, accessible and understandable to to different to different audiences. I, I would uh, in in time maybe next time I'll talk about the leadership development for analysts course. I do encourage people to apply. We got a, a, I've extended the um, the registration period by a week. Um, that starts in December. I, I would encourage you to apply for that. A lot of this is covered in that. Uh, about how to that interface, that really important interface between the analysts and the, and those decision makers, um, and that we go into a lot of depth um, in that four day course. And we have other one day courses which may be more accessible to more people about data visualization and just really um, showing presenting information and and findings in, in that really accessible way to people so that they can understand it and believe it and guess what do something about it because we, we want to have an impact anyway i'm going to i'm going to i'm going to stop right now and i'm just going to say thank you again everybody for coming uh, in the out there people who i can't see and uh, thank you becca thank you nikki for your contribution i do hope your partner recovers well uh, and completely and uh thank thank you janine um and i'm uh, glad you had a nice uh, time last night and uh, good luck in your new role and i look forward to hearing more about it very soon okay i, I shall close 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 down now thanks very much bye bye thanks, everyone everyone